Hi, this is Dale Buchanan, the host of Puppy Talk Podcast. Before we get started today, I wanted to let you know of my new book, The Complete Puppy Training Manual. It's available on Amazon in four formats Kindle ebook, paperback, hardcover, and audiobook. You can find it on Amazon right now. It's called The Complete Puppy Training Manual, and I will put a link in the show notes of this episode. I'm Dale Buchanan, and this is Puppy Talk, the podcast that offers advice on how to raise a healthy, happy, and obedient puppy. This podcast is sponsored by Top Gun Dog Training. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast now so you don't miss a single episode of Puppy Talk. Welcome to Puppy Talk, episode number 27. Today we've got a very special guest. Erith Bloom. I hope I pronounced that correctly. We're going to talk today about leash training for puppies. I've been waiting to talk about this topic for quite a while, and I wanted to get a puppy expert who can help collaborate with me on this topic and talk about important things of leash training your puppy. And I first met or first found out about Erith when we connected after the Winter Summit, the Dog Trainers Winter Summit last December. And she did a presentation about the human side of dog training, how dog trainers need to get along with the dog owners. And this is very important because as dog trainers, if we don't get along with the dog owners, the owners are writing the check, to be honest with you. And the dogs, they have to like us too, but the owners have to like us more. And I was really impressed by her talk with Susan Light's podcast, Doggy Dojo, on puppy socialization. So I messaged her and I said, hey, why don't you come on my podcast? And let's pick out a topic, and we brainstormed, and we came up with Lease Training for Puppies. So here we are, and welcome. Hi, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I'm I'm really, really pleased and grateful to be speaking to your audience, so thank you so much for having me. I just want to say that it is always a thrill to be asked to be on something like this. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. It warms my heart. And hopefully you'll get a lot of good information and your audience will get a lot of good information and I know we're going to have a great conversation. Just to give you a tiny bit more background about me, I have been training dogs since I was literally a child because when my parents were too busy to do the training, so it all kind of fell to me. And for a long time, I trained dogs for friends and family and myself without really going into it in any sort of professional way. And then Uh, I guess we're looking at about, I don't know, a couple decades ago, I had a dog who had a lot of problems. And at that point, I started looking into what had changed in the world of dog training and got myself well educated to help that dog. And people kept asking me if I was a professional. And so after a while, I thought, hmm, maybe this would be something that would be fun to do as a professional. And so I got into professional training. I am a certified professional dog trainer. I'm a certified dog behavior consultant. I have a whole bunch of certifications that people can feel free to look up on my website. But what I really love is helping people and their dogs live happier, more fulfilled lives together. And that's what it's all about. I'm here to empower dogs to make good choices and help them be happier and healthier in their home so that the people are happier and healthier too. That's amazing because the mission of this show is to help owners raise a happy, healthy, obedient puppy. And you said two of those three things right there. And in addition, what is your website? So everybody can look that up. Yeah, I should really have said that part. So it's the sophisticateddog.com. So there's two Excellent. D's in a row in there, the sophisticated ending in a D and then another D for dog.com. All right. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. We're going to get started with this topic. I have a couple of of basic questions, and then we're going to get into some more elaborate talk about puppy training and what owners should do and should not do. So let's just start with the basics. What age should owners start walking their puppy on a leash? I know a lot of dog owners get puppies at eight weeks old to 10 weeks old from a breeder or a a local pet store or something like that. And the vets say to them, don't take your puppy outside because they could get some parvo or some other virus and you have to be very careful until they get all of their shots 
But I personally, I train a lot of puppies, about 90% puppies, and I start leash training puppies at a very young age. What is your take on that? And what do you think is the best age to start leash training a puppy? So I'm going to answer that question in two parts. The first thing I'll say is the best age to start leash training a puppy is basically the moment the puppy is old enough to have a leash attached to something and walk around in it. So for most of our sort of general public coming in with a puppy, that does mean eight weeks. You can start leash training at eight weeks, absolutely. But we do have to balance that with the medical concerns. Uh, I used to work at a veterinary hospital many, many years ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. And I have seen puppies with parvo. And believe me, you don't want your puppy to get parvo. So what you do is talk to your veterinarian about safe ways to have your puppy out and about. Often what I'll do is I'll have people do the leash training part on their property in their home where they have more control over the environment and then take the puppy out either in their arms or in some kind of sling. You know, they actually make puppy slings or in a carriage so that they get exposed to the world but without necessarily being exposed to all of those nasty viruses. So you kind of have to do a little bit of a balancing act. I will say many veterinarians will tell you that it is fine to walk your dog off the property once they've had their third set of shots. You certainly want them off the property sooner than that, but not necessarily with all four paws on the ground, especially if you live in an area with a lot of moist sort of dirt, grass, because that's where all those viruses and bacteria live. Right. So that sort of answers the health question. But to get back to the age question, as far as I'm concerned, if you have a collar on the dog or you can put a harness on the dog and the dog can walk, you can start leash training. Leash training is not something that has to wait until they're able to walk around and, you know, run in the dirt wherever other dogs have been. It's something that can start in your living room or your bathroom or your kitchen, for that matter, as soon as they're old enough to have a leash put on. Right. I agree with that. And with Dixie, she was 10 weeks old. I had her, I showed a client of mine a video of this, of this yesterday. And when she was here at my apartment, during the first hour, I had her on a leash and a collar, and I'm teaching her a recall the first hour that I have her in the on the sidewalk of the apartment community in front of my building. And I'm calling her name, I'm teaching her her name, and to come to me and teaching her leash training the very first hour that I had her. But it was on sidewalk. We have a very wide sidewalk. It wasn't on grass. It wasn't nothing that was going to harm her or compromise her medical health. And it was teaching her things. And I also like what you said too, because with her, I used a slip lead inside the house with some obedience training because she always wanted to go off and do things, but I wanted to keep her focused for at least a minute to do some downs. <laughs> you know, So to keep her with me, I had to put a little slip lead on it. Just say, Dixie, stay with me here for a minute and let's do some training. And she was a rock star. She did it very well, but the slip lead inside the house really helped a lot. So I, I agree with that. When you talk about equipment, where do we go from here? Because I know young puppies, you go to a pet store and the person at Pet Supermarket or Petco will sell you whatever is the best seller on there. And they aren't real educated with dog training, but they're probably going to sell two things. Both I have a little bit of a problem with to some extent, a rear clip harness and a retractable leash <laughs> for a 10 week old puppy. Tell us a little bit about what you use for the equipment with the puppies that you train at a young age outside. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to just join in with you on objecting to retractable leashes. If I could make those things against the law, I would. That is how much I dislike them. They're dangerous. They teach the dog bad habits. I've, I've actually run experiments with dogs I know who are well leash trained. And based on the way those dogs behave on a retractable leash, it's very clear that retractable leashes teach pulling. Because any dog who's not, who's trained not to pull, they won't move away from you when they're on a retractable leash. They stay by your side and look at you funny and say, why do you keep pulling me backwards? Why do you keep pulling me backwards? So I do believe retractable leashes teach dogs to pull. And they're also very hazardous. People get injured by them all the time. I won't go into all the deep, dark. Ugh, it's, it's pretty bad. Some really bad things can happen to you with those leashes. For equipment, 
ideally, I like to have a dog in a harness because that distributes the pressure of the leash better for those times when they zig and you zag. Usually, once the dog's above a certain age, I'm going to put them in a front clip harness. I'm always a little bit more cautious with a front clip harness only because I don't want to restrict the puppy's shoulder movement too much, and they can restrict the shoulder movement. For a very young puppy, a back harness is a back clip harness is fine as long as you're training the dog how to walk in it. The key is that the equipment doesn't teach the dog very much. Even a front clip harness doesn't really teach the dog very much. You're responsible for teaching the dog how to walk. So I have a lot of clients who have puppies that are just literally too small for the harnesses I like the best. And you kind of, in the beginning, you go with whatever fits because it's a little bit better than a collar. I try to find something that's a little bit cushy that spreads out the pressure. Like I don't love the way many step-in harnesses work in terms of how you put them on, but they do have these mesh designs that are easier on the puppy's body. You want the puppy to feel comfortable in the harness so that they're not miserable in it all the time. So basically for most of my puppy clients, the factors that come into play are how big is the puppy? What are even the options out there? There are some cases where there's just not a lot of good options and you just do whatever you can. And then we're going to step up to a more comfortable and potentially also a front clip harness as the dog is big enough and old enough to handle that. But if the dog learns how to walk perfectly right from the beginning, then you're never going to need the front clip harness because the dog isn't pulling on the leash in the first place. So the perfection would be that I never need it. The reality is that I almost always need it because the world is exciting. So definitely a harness. I usually just use a six foot leash. It's a nice standard length. It's long enough to reach even short puppies on the ground without the person having to feel like they're sort of bending over. If you do attach the leash to a collar, you just have to be extra, extra careful that there's not a lot of pulling going on. And then the other tip that I give clients is since puppies often like to bite the leash, one thing you can do is you can get a very light weight chain leash. So I want to be absolutely clear here. I'm not talking about a chain collar, not a choke chain, not a prong collar. I'm talking about a leash that is made of chain links and has a handle at one end and a clip at the other. And that way, if the puppy does turn around, the leash just isn't a tempting thing to bite on. Where fabric because they're not going to bite metal, tempting. right? <laughs> most of them, unless they're already in the habit of biting the leash, most of them are not going to bite metal. Exactly. And it's just not fun. It doesn't feel good in their mouth, I think. So instead of having your puppy learn to turn around and bite that piece of fabric that's waving in front of them, you just use a chain leash. But it has to be really lightweight because otherwise, puppies are so small, it literally weighs them down. Right. I agree with everything you said. And I'm so, I'm like bowing at you right now. Bowing, <laughs> bowing, bowing at, through the camera. We, we can see each other, but we only, only record audio here. But the, the retractable leash, thank you for saying that. I completely agree with you. I had a client this morning who the Cavapoo that I told you about pre-recording that I was training. And this little uh, Yorkie came up and it was on a retractable leash, a 20 foot leash. And the owner's way over there and the puppy's near near their dog. And he says, well, I don't understand why we're working with training. And she was, he, he was doing so well. But when this, when this dog came over, he started to really react. I said, it's not your dog's fault. It's the owner's fault of that dog for letting her dog have too much freedom. And the dog has no control over his own reactivity. So your dog's just responding to that. Let's just walk the other direction and not worry about it. And sure enough, five or six other dogs came around that were very well behaved on six foot leashes connection to the owner, and the puppy was very, very good, very well behaved. Another thing, too, and we'll get into this in a minute, the woman with the dog on the retractable leash was on her cell phone, talking oh. on her phone, wasn't even paying attention to the dog. So we'll get to that in a minute. That's a big pet peeve of mine because, in fact, you know what? We'll just talk about that now. Okay? Yes, because... I, am, I am right there with you. <laughs> That's one of my rules of dog walking that I teach everybody is cell phone, leave it home or turn it off and put it in your pocket. And I mean off, not on, on vibrate. I mean off, off, unless you are a neurosurgeon or a heart surgeon and you might get called into the hospital at a moment's notice, you can give your puppy 
20 minutes of your full attention. Why is that important? Explain that to the listeners, to give them your undivided attention. Such a great question. Thank you for asking that. So the thing is that puppies are going to, to a large extent, and I don't want to oversimplify this because it's not exactly 100%, but to a large extent, puppies are going to give back what we give them. So if we're constantly disengaging from our puppy and playing with our phone and not giving them any attention, then our puppy is going to say, huh, every time I try to pay attention to you, you're not looking at me anyway. And they're going to disengage from us and stop giving us attention. So that's one important reason is if I want my puppy to learn to pay attention to me, especially out on walks in the exciting real world, then I should give my puppy attention while I'm out on walks instead of staring at an electronic box. The other thing is if you are busy staring at your phone, like let's not even talk about the sort of obvious things that can happen when you don't have a puppy with you. Like you could walk right through a red light into traffic. You could trip over something. You could run into someone. There's a lot of things that can, you know, physically go wrong. But putting that aside, now you're not watching your puppy. And even on a six foot leash, they have enough leeway. Maybe they've just dashed over and gotten under someone else's feet. And now that person is trying not to trip over them. Or maybe there's a dog around the corner and they got around the corner that little bit faster than you. And now they're face to face with a dog who maybe doesn't love puppies. And maybe you would have seen that if you'd been paying attention. Or maybe they've picked up, and we'll talk about picking up things because you don't have to worry about most of the things your puppy picks up. But maybe they picked up something truly dangerous, like a broken piece of glass or some kind of, uh, I've literally, it doesn't happen often where I live now, but I have literally seen rat poison in places and you don't want your puppy to go and pick that up. And if you're not paying attention, there are all these hazards for your puppy. Just as ideally with, you know, your children, when you're interacting with your children and it's time that you're spending together, you're going to give them your full attention. Walks are one of those times when I think it's about the puppy and it's about the engagement. And all of that is going to help build you a stronger bond. And if instead of taking that time and using it to bond, you take that time to disengage, your bond with your puppy won't be as strong. And then all kinds of other important behaviors, like coming when called, will not be as strong. I agree 100%. Thank you so much for that explanation. And I'm going to add to that just a couple of little points. My puppy was outside today and I got distracted and she did number two. And I thought, did you do number one? I wasn't paying attention. That one 15 second block, I wasn't paying attention. And I thought, I have to go train a dog. You have to go inside in your crate. You may, If you didn't pee since last night, I could be in trouble if I leave you in the crate. So I kept walking her around. And I, I guess, well, Dixie, I guess you, I guess you went potty. I w it's my fault. I wasn't paying attention. That one thing there, when you're potty training a puppy, is disastrous if you're not knowing when they go pee. Because a lot of puppies will go outside when they're very young and pee three or four times because they don't know how to empty their bladder and control their bladder yet at 12 weeks old, for example. And another thing too, Dixie, my puppy, got Giardia nine times in five months from oh, other God. dogs' contaminated feces. So you don't want your puppy picking up any dog feces or getting their nose or mouth into it, and even on their paws, because when it gets on their paws and they start licking their paws, they could get that parasite. And then you have to treat it with a dewormer. And it's just, I had to use a syringe to squirt that stuff in her mouth. And she hated it. And finally, she got over it. Her immune system was built up at nine months old. And she never got it again. And she's about 15 months old now. So I've been lucky. But I've been very strict with her. And I see people come out of my apartment complex. And they come out of the elevator. And they're on their phone. The second they come out of the elevator, their dogs are on their back leg. They have a flat collar. They're up on their front legs. They're barking and howling and crying. And the owner's still on their phone, not even caring. Now, how horrible. That, that bothers me. And I can't say anything to them. I could. But if I do, then I create conflict with my neighbors. And it's just like, I want them to come to me and say, hey, your dog's really good. Can you teach me that? Yes. Number one, give me your phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting exactly. it in my pocket. And then I'm going to give you a free sample of what we're going to do right now. That's what yeah. I would do. But very few of them actually ask me. A few of them do, and I have them as clients, but not many of them. 
And so that was a great discussion. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. When we are talking about puppy walks, I know with my clients, I have several different types of walks that I have with them, especially with Dixie, my own puppy. I might just go for a potty break or I might do some leash training or I might do some enrichment. What is your take on that? How many different types of walks should an owner have with their puppy so that their puppy can go outside and have some a variety of different things to do outside other than just go potty break and come back inside? Right. Such a great question. So the first thing I'll say is with young puppies, don't think about walks as exercise. Young puppies still have developing joints and systems. I'm sorry, physical exercise. Let me clarify that. And you don't want to think, oh, I need to go out there and walk my dog for 45 minutes because she needs the exercise. Don't go down that path. Your eight-week-old, 12-week-old puppy does not need a 45-minute march to meet her physical needs. In fact, it may make her sore and tired and do some damage to her potentially. So walks with a very young puppy especially need to go at the puppy's pace and they shouldn't be too long. And when your puppy starts getting tired, you turn around and you go home. And if she's already so tired that she can't pick herself up off the sidewalk, you pick her up and take her home. So I just want to make that point first, that physically, young puppies, yeah, they have a ton of energy, but that ton of energy doesn't translate into let's go two miles walking at a 15 mile an hour, I mean, not 15 miles, sorry, 15 minute mile pace, which is a very fast walking pace, by the way. They're not going to benefit from that. So let's set that kind of walk aside. The other kinds of walks you can have are training walks basically sort of sniffy enrichment walks. And I actually usually combine the two a little bit. So what I mean by a training walk is I've started teaching my puppy how to walk indoors, which I've usually done by I clip a leash on and if they're near me, they get a treat. And then I take a step and if they stay near me, they get another treat. And we just slowly build up from there. I usually start in a really small room so it's easy for the puppy to stay near me. So bonus, they're being successful a lot. And then I spread that into larger and larger spaces and more and more exciting environments. So now I'm on a walk with my puppy and she's right there next to me. I'm going to hand her a treat. Bonus. Awesome. You're right next to me. And that part of the walk then is a little bit of training. She looks at me. I praise her. I hand her a treat. I take a few more steps. She's walking with me. She gets another treat. That's like a training walk. We're walking. The dog is giving me attention. The dog is keeping pace with me. And I'm going to reward that with treats and praise and anything else that the puppy enjoys. Like if the puppy really loves butt scritches, I'll give him butt scritches or whatever it happens to be. The other kind of walk is where you follow the puppy. So instead of the puppy paying attention and following you, you're still paying attention to each other. But now your job is to keep the leash loose. And the puppy says, oh, wow, this is a really interesting tree right here. I want to sniff that. And you say, okay. You stand around. You watch the puppy. You wonder what they're thinking about. Maybe you talk to them about it. I usually talk to them about it. And they sniff for a while. And then they're like, okay, I'm done. And they move on to the next thing. And you go along with them to the next spot that they want to sniff. And then maybe they lie down in the grass. And maybe they roll around a little And maybe they sort of contemplate the sky. I don't even know what they're thinking about. Often their noses are going. They're smelling something in the air. Just stand there. Let them get over it. Keep moving. And that's really good mental enrichment. And your puppy will be more tired from a training walk or an enrichment walk than from one of those crazy exercise walks where their body will be tired, but their brain will not. The other thing is what I usually do is I combine the two. So at the beginning of the walk, we do a little bit of training. And then I'm like, okay, it's your walk now. And we go out and we do some sniffing. Now, if I want my puppy to potty and potty quickly for the times in my life when I might need the puppy to potty, what I do is I train the puppy that the first thing we do when we walk out is we stand still for a while until the puppy potties. And I just stand there like a post and I wait for the puppy to potty. And as soon as the puppy potties, then we start our training or our enrichment or whatever it is. So we get the pottying out of the way early. You duplicate everything that I do. And it's we never discussed this before, everybody. No. <laughs> we never did. 
It is exactly what I do. And I, I look at it like this. Dog goes potty. You do a little obedience with them. And I even put them in a sit, make them wait, do a couple of things like that in addition yeah. to what you said. And then they get a life reward. Enrichment. Roll around in the grass. Have some fun. And owners get so bent out of shape about this. My puppy goes out in the grass and they just want to lay there. So what? <laughs> That's okay. Your puppy can lay there in the grass. It's okay. They can lay and roll around. That's fun for them. They're enjoying that. They're getting enrichment and socialization. And like you said, we don't know what they're thinking. It doesn't matter. They are having fun. And after they've done their homework, then they can have some recess. That's the way I look at it. I love that. I love that. They've done their homework and now they get some recess. I love that. That's really great. What happens when puppies are going outside and they are chewing on the leash? Now, you talked about one thing about the, the metal leash. And, the, and I have a Wamraner that I train. We use an easy clip harness. It's a, uh, a pet safe, easy, uh, easy walk harness. Yeah. And it clips in the front, right? And this dog, they've already gone through two leashes. It is very mouthy and it's already 65 pounds at six months old. Oh, and, my. Oh, it is really mouthy and it's really, really a lot of energy. So it's a catch-22. The owner wants to take it on enough walks to where it gets that enrichment and gets a little bit of discipline. And I even put some videos of the owner with me coaching her doing some of the training walk with that dog with distractions of children right in front of it. And it did great but it wants to chew on the leash all the time. So is the only solution for the leash biting going to be the metal leash like you explained, or are there other options or there are training things when the puppy gets six, seven, eight, nine months old and they're still doing that? Right, so there's definitely other options. So one thing I'll say is I don't usually use the easy walk harness. I'm just, I know no one else will be able to see this, but I'm gonna hold up my little stuffed dog wearing a freedom harness. My harness of choice, if you want a front clip harness, is the Freedom Harness. And part of the reason that I like it, I'm just going to demo this for Dale, even though the rest of you can't see it, is that it has two leash clips. And so one of the things that I sometimes do if I've got a dog, especially in a Freedom Harness, which, mind you, if your dog is too small, there is a size below which they don't make them, is I will clip one leash to the back of the dog, one leash to the front of the dog. I'm holding both leashes, and as soon as the dog starts biting one of the leashes, I just let that leash go. Now, I've still got a hold of the dog because I've still got another leash on the dog. And you could do this if you don't have a harness that has two clips. You could clip one leash to the harness, one leash to the collar. You could clip two leashes to the harness if you wanted to. But the key is, for most dogs, when they're chewing on the leash, it's about that accidental game of tug that they're getting. I can ask people not to tug back, but it's very difficult if you haven't practiced not to tug back. We humans, just like our dogs, you pull on us, we pull back, you pull on them, they pull back. It's called opposition reflex. It's a natural thing. What I usually do personally, if I'm holding a leash and the puppy has jumped up and is chewing the leash, I actually just, I literally put my hand a little closer to the puppy so that there's no tension on the leash at all. Once the tension disappears, most puppies will let go. If that doesn't work, I drop the leash because I have a second leash on the puppy because I know that this is something that the puppy does. And I just keep repeating that. But the most, and, and then most of them get over it. The other thing I do is from the beginning, I say, oh my gosh, you're one of those puppies who likes to bite on the leash. So any moment when they aren't, they're getting praise and a treat. Oh, nice job. We're walking so nicely. Praise treat, praise treat get them thinking about something other than biting the leash. So basically, to sum up sort of the three ideas, one is two leashes and drop whichever one the dog is pulling on. Don't turn it into a game of tug. If you, can, if you yourself can control that urge to pull backwards, which is really, it's quite instinctive, and you can just let the leash stay loose, many puppies will just let go. And then the other thing is, Look for all the times when your puppy isn't biting the leash because chances are he isn't biting the leash the second you start. And so if you can get a few treats in for mouth off of the leash, most puppies will start doing less and less of the biting. And I've had some puppies that like just drop the habit entirely once they figure out that they can get a reinforcer for something else. Why does a leave it or drop it command, which has previously been taught inside the house, for impulse control and 
frustration tolerance. Why does that not work at this point when they're biting on the leash? That's a really great question. And my main concern in that situation is that we're going to get a behavior chain going. Let's assume you say leave it or drop it, which depending on, to me, if you've already got the leash in your mouth, it's a drop it, but it doesn't matter, whichever word you prefer. And the dog lets go of the leash and you say, oh, good job dropping the leash and you hand them a treat. What have they just learned? They've learned if I grab the treat, then you will say drop it. Then I drop the leash, then I get a treat. So what I don't want to do is get in this loop where I'm actually teaching the dog to do the behavior I don't want because I'm rewarding that. Now, the other thing is even to, to sort of address the larger question of the leave it and drop it, leave it and drop it in the house is usually a much less exciting situation. Right. And just like you might not be able to do calculus when there is a parade going by, I mean, if, if you do calculus at all, I'm the daughter of a mathematician, so I do calculus, but I'm not sure if I could do it with a parade going by. So when you're asking your dog to leave it or drop it out in the real world, that's like asking them to do it with a parade going by as opposed to in a quiet room. As with any other behavior inside, it's, it can be an A or a B, but outside it automatically drops to a C or D because of distractions and stimulus. What else do you think is important when people start to leash train their puppies. Now let's go up into a little little older puppy. We talked a lot about eight to 16 weeks. Let's go now 16 weeks. They've had all their shots. They've had their rabies. They can go on grass. They can forage a little bit more. They're going to go reach into their adolescent age. Maybe they're nine months old. What do we do with the puppy at that point? Well, one thing is, and this is also true even for the babies, one thing is don't sweat the small stuff. And what I mean by that is, Your dog may pick up a leaf. Your dog may chew on a berry. We have ficus trees, fig trees everywhere where I live. And they drop these berries and some of the dogs think they're really tasty. It is not worth arguing over every single thing your dog picks up unless you literally know it is highly, highly toxic. So those leaves they pick up, those sticks they pick up, those berries they pick up, usually if you just keep moving, they will drop them and move on. And if instead you're like, oh oh my gosh, you've got a stick. No, no, that's going to get caught in your throat. Something bad's going to happen. Leave it, leave it, drop it, drop it. I'm grabbing it out of the puppy's mouth. And now I've made a really big deal out of it. And now it's very valuable. And what many dogs learn is they're going to grab it out of my mouth, so I better swallow it before they take it away from me. And so then you're you're in even worse shape. So what I'll say is don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the like, I want to stop and sniff here. Great. Sniff around. I picked something up. Great. We're just going to keep walking and you'll either carry it or you won't. But if you, if you want your dog's walk to be some, if you have some image of perfection in your head, your walks will be very annoying for both you and your puppy, especially your older puppy, who at this point is in the teenage, my brain is no longer really quite in gear. The clutch is slipping, for those of you who drive a stick shift, and I can't stay in gear for very long. When they're in that mode, you got to kind of say, you know, I got 15 feet of really nice walking out of you. Let's just let you sniff around and do whatever you want to do. But definitely be prepared to reward all that nice behavior with food or praise or a ball or whatever really jazzes your dog up. Remember that for most dogs, praise is not that exciting. So I usually go with food or a tug toy, something like that. And the other thing is, as dogs hit adolescence, sometimes they get a little bit more cautious, I guess is a good word about things. And so just like when your puppy was a baby and you were trying to teach them everything is good, you look at something and you look maybe a little unsure, I'm going to comfort you and hand you a treat so that you see that it's not a problem, it's not a big deal. You can do the same thing with your older dog. So when you see that older puppy, I mean, when you see that like five month old puppy who's suddenly staring at another dog, what I do is I just talk to them about it. I'm like, oh, look, there's another dog. You are so smart to spot that other dog. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Would you like a treat? Okay, are you ready to move on? So again, it's sort of that don't sweat the small stuff. We're just going to say, oh, nice job. You noticed it. Have a treat and move on whether you're following them or whether they're following you, keeping the walk going will often really, really help with all of the little things like picking up random things, 
or getting overexcited about this or that. Like you were talking about Dixie, you know, maybe meeting a dog and finding that, or no, it was a client's dog, sorry, meeting a dog and maybe finding that a little too exciting and you just moved on. And then the next dog, the interaction was more positive and everything went better. It's just good to just keep the walk going at a relaxed pace. And most dogs will just let it slide off their back, so to speak, once they've moved away a little bit. Yeah. And it's important that you mentioned in there for the client not to get too excited and overstimulate the puppy at that point, because that's the most yeah. common thing that I see. Oh, my puppy. I go to train, I go to train the puppy and I'm going for maybe their fifth or sixth session. The puppy's doing great. How's such and such doing today? How's Fido doing today? Oh, well, not so good. Why? They picked up a leaf or a stick on the walk. And that's just so, it's like, but look at all the 99 other things he does well. Like you said, it's just a leaf, nothing bad. It's just a stick. He chewed it up. He swallowed it. It's a little bit of fiber. It's not going to kill him. It's not going to hurt him. It's going to pass through. And what, and I always ask, what did you do when that happened? Oh, I was just telling him to drop it and telling him to leave it and telling him no and trying to get it out of his mouth. And then he got all excited. He started jumping on me. And then it was just, I had to just bring him back inside. It was just terrible. That's not the puppy. That's you. <laughs> okay. So the puppy true. could care less. That's your, that's your responsibility right there for controlling yourself. Because we can over, and I've talked about this in other episodes, ways that we overstimulate and overexcite our puppies. By constantly talking to them in that way and touching them all the time. and try We can't do that on a walk. We have to keep them focused on the walk or let them play. And be very calm and relaxed. Be very nonchalant about it. Unless there's a dog off leash that's come running at you and you think this dog is a threat to your dog. Then you have to react a little bit differently. But those situations are very, very few. Yes, we hope they're very rare. You mentioned something in passing there that I do want to touch on, which is the jumping up on you as you're walking, that is another good thing to just walk through. Like if you just kind of keep moving forward instead of no, no, down, down, or whatever. I, by the way, I hate it when people say down. This is just a pet peeve for get off of me because down to me means belly on the ground. So no, no, off, off, down, down, whatever they're saying, all of that is giving your puppy attention. And the jumping is usually about getting your attention they're a little overexcited. If you just kind of keep moving them forward, just, just keep walking, they'll usually stop jumping. And then once they're not jumping, you can be like, oh, hey, look what a fabulous puppy you are. Here, have a treat. You're such a good boy. Right. We're capturing that behavior and rewarding it at that time. Yes. And of course, as you just pointed out, I wouldn't necessarily say out loud what I just said. In my head, <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, look what a great puppy you are. But my voice is saying, oh, you're being such a good boy. It's so important to capture those moments while you're walking. So important, much more than trying to command those mo those sits and stays and waits and downs and all of that stuff and behave with a cue. Let the puppy do it himself. Classical conditioning and let them just stop the behavior, be calm, reward that. Then they're going to keep doing that more, right? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, whatever we practice is what we get good at for better or for worse. Whatever gets more reinforcement is what we get better at. So if you reinforce calm behavior, and I'm such, uh, anyone who's worked with me as a puppy client knows that I teach multiple different things for relaxation and controlling that sort of arousal excitement. So whatever you can do to teach your puppy calm is a good idea. And what that means is when you see that calm behavior, reinforce that calm behavior. And the more you reinforce it, the more your dog will practice it. And because they practice it, they'll get better at it. Yes. I like to do what I did this morning with my Cavapoo client. First session, we did the calming behavior on his bed, downstay. He waited for 30 seconds. I have this on video. And then we did that for 15 minutes. And then we went outside and he was really, really good. And the owner said, he's never been this calm before. I said, well, we set him up for success. Because we did a little bit of training inside the house first, and then we took him outside with that mindset instead of overstimulating him and then taking him outside and him going outside already overstimulated and overexcited. He's going outside with a calm demeanor in the first place. And that worked right. out really, really good. 
Yeah, that's such a terrific way to do things. And sometimes uh, if, you know, the listeners want sort of a specific, like what do you train specifically before you take the dog out? Work on your leash walking indoors. That's a nice specific thing to work on. Practice some sits and downs. And if your dog spins on cue, whatever they know how to do on cue, that's great. But then walk them around, get them in the rhythm of walking next to you for their treats. And then when you walk out the door, they're already in the rhythm. Such a great thing to train in advance of the walk. Such a great thing. This has been an amazing conversation and an amazing topic for our listeners. Is there any last minute tips that you want to provide for leash training puppies or even adult dogs for that matter? Because we have an adult, a lot of adult dog listeners too. So this is right. the last chance to add any other training <laughs> tips before we close this episode up. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts. So much pressure. No, seriously, just about everything I just said about baby dogs, young dogs, applies to adult dogs. The thing I will say is if, you, if you've adopted an adult dog who already has issues barking at people or scooters or other dogs on walks, it is a good idea if you're not a professional yourself to consult a professional for help. Make sure that they are a certified professional dog trainer or a certified behavior consultant because dog training is not a regulated industry. And whatever you do, my biggest advice is be patient. When in doubt, take a breath. Patience is the number one qualification for being a good dog trainer. Being able to just take a breath and just say, maybe this won't work perfectly this minute. Maybe it won't even work perfectly this week. But what you're looking for is progress over the course of several weeks not progress from necessarily today to tomorrow. Progress goes in a non, it's not a straight line. It's it not goes linear. up and down. It's not linear at all. One walk could be good. And if you do five walks a day, you could have four good ones and one bad one. And if you yes. have every day can't be good, one day is going to be totally bad. And that's life. Yes. And so I guess my final tip would be, if things aren't going perfectly, a lot of times that just means you need to work on it for a little longer. But if you see the trend lines going in the wrong direction, then seek help or change what you're doing, one or the other. So change what you're doing with help. And I also think that short walks for young puppies are better, too. We never really discussed yeah. that. But the shorter durations are better because once they check out, you're not going to be able to teach them anything anyway. You're just spending, spinning your wheels there trying to figure out why the puppy doesn't want to cooperate. And then you get frustrated and then the puppy gets frustrated and then that's bad. So I like short walks for young puppies. So Yeah. And I will also say, even if you have an adult dog who doesn't walk well, I do short, boring walks for dogs who don't walk well. We walk down the driveway. You get excited the minute we step off the driveway. That's fine. We're going to walk back up the driveway. Right. We're going to go up and down the driveway until you're calm when we step out the, the driveway onto the street. And right. then we walk one house and you get excited. That's fine. We'll walk back to the driveway, out to that house, back to the driveway, out to that house until you're calm there. And I just build the distance. Now I might walk for 20 minutes up and down the driveway, mm -hmm. but that distance will take more time. And with a young puppy, I would not walk 20 minutes up and down a driveway. That would be with an adult dog. One more question I have. I just thought of this from a neighbor of mine who's not my client. Young puppies running on pavement. So I will, first of all, I just have to say, this is not my area of expertise. Yeah. I pay a lot of attention though, to physical health and well-being. 12 weeks and a lot of running on pavement is not a great idea. You want your young puppy running on soft surfaces and you want to make sure that your puppy can stop anytime because if something's hurting, they'll stop and they'll make sure that they don't make it hurt worse. But if you're forcing them to run, then they'll have to run through that pain and then you can do some real damage. But hard surfaces, not ideal, especially for a young puppy. And honestly, they're not great for your three-year-old dog either. You're better off if you can getting on trails. But walking on hard surfaces is okay, especially for an adult dog. And I think that's because young puppies is the joints from what I read. You know, it's our job to educate. That's what we're doing. I'm not a veterinarian. Exactly. I'm not an expert in puppy growth and physiology and things like that. And what I'll say is, in general, I also defer to the veterinarian on this. I will say, is my dog old enough to go running with me? And veterinarians know the answer to that. So let's tell the listeners again how to find you. So the best way to reach me is through my website, which is thesophisticateddog.com. 
I also have a fairly active Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash the sophisticated dog. And you can find me on LinkedIn using my name, which is Irit, spelled I-R-I-T-H, Bloom, B-L-O-O-M. And I am fairly active on LinkedIn as well. For those of you with puppies, I do have a Facebook page dedicated to puppies where it's me and three other trainers who we, we sort of time share so that everyone always has someone answering their questions. It's called Puppy Help Hotline. So if you just search Facebook Puppy Help Hotline, you will find your way there. We would love to have you join us. That is awesome. And when I get this episode edited and live, I will send you a link and maybe you could post a link on there for all of your people on there to listen to because I think we provided some amazing information in this episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will be sharing this. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and we're going to stay in touch. I want to have you back on the show again sometime in the future. We'll come up with some more topics to talk about because this one was so great. I'm going to close off this episode number 27 of Puppy Talk. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and have a great day. This is Dale Buchanan, host of Puppy Talk Podcast. I have an announcement of a new book that I just published called Potty Training Your Puppy. It's available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback, soon to be available on audiobook. You can find out all the details of this book using the link in the show notes. It's called Potty Training Your Puppy. It's a comprehensive book with a simple and effective way to help potty train your puppy. And it really works. Check out the link in the show notes.